So just to give you the range, um, it's now 600 uh, highly educated people uh, located around the world, particularly in Geneva, where our headquarters is. So that's the forum. This is a very disturbing um, the progress for many, peop for many people, and they just feel overwhelmed. And you develop some kind of a bunker mentality. You say, uh, why not my little small world? Um, and this creates a kind of um, uh, tendency to, of egoism, uh, maybe uh, even nationalism, mm -hmm. fundamentalism. You want to go back to the old world. And that's, for example, also certainly one of the reasons uh, for um, the success uh, of uh, presidential candidate Trump in the United States because so many people are afraid to lose the job. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, uh, I, um, I would say today we are in a, in a global situation where we can nearly distinguish between an elite population which will have the benefits of all this fourth industrial revolution. We have at the upper end, and we have at the lower end the, um, um, what you would call in the traditional language, the proletariat. Mm -hmm. I wrote in 1970 a book um, which was called Modern Management. So it's many years ago. And in the book, um, my first chapter actually is focusing on what is the purpose of a company. Mm. And I developed at that time what is now called, and I probably documented it for the first time, what is now called the multi-stakeholder theory. Which means that um, uh, leaders, in, in a, uh, business leaders, should not only serve shareholders, the traditional shareholders concept, but should serve all those who have a stake in the company, which means uh, employees, which means government, uh, clients, and so on. So that was the, uh, the origin, and that was why I, uh, why I devoted my life at the end to this uh, multi-stakeholder concept. Now, over the last 40 years, uh, this multi-stakeholder concept has developed like everything which is globalized. I would say we have now also a global multi-stakeholder concept. Every year in January, presidents, prime ministers, secretaries of state, chancellors of the Exchequer, Nobel Prize winners, journalists that you see every day on TV, programmers, founders at software corporate giants, in other words, people who now need only first names like Bill or Jack or Mark or Angela or Angelina. People who need only first names gather at this to discuss the great issues of the day. And what happens at Davos at these meetings is then both touchstone and predictor for the critical issues that will engage world politics, international business, and the global economy. Davos helps shape the global agenda. And through the World Economic Forum's fellows and young global leaders and its entire range of participants, Davos reaches out and helps change the world. Now, having become so successful and so central, it is a measure of the success of Davos that it has spawned both progeny and cheap imitation. Anything that comes close to having aspirations in the same direction or attendees who inhabit the same global cultural space will be quickly tagged China's answer to Davos or Davos in the Middle East or Asia's Davos. That is the kind of place that Davos occupies in the cultural mind space. And with us this evening is Professor Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. He 
is the powerhouse energy and the force behind and the intellectual center of the forum. From his having been one of the youngest ever faculty members at Geneva, he has taken his research and his writing on corporate responsibility towards the largest possible multiple stakeholder on our planet. With all the current issues on our agenda, we tend to forget that we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, which accelerates global change in much more comprehensive and faster ways than the previous three revolutions. And you see, the difference of this fourth uh, industrial revolution is it doesn't change what you are doing. It changes you. If you take a genetic editing, right. uh, just as an example, it's you who exactly. are changed. Yeah. And of yeah. course, this has a big impact on yeah. your identity. We need to realize that humans are now hackable animals. You can hack them. A good two-way communication system, direct communication system, between brains and computers, this is kind of a, the, the watershed moment. I mean, once you have a good two-way, nobody has any idea what happens after that. Well, I think maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing they will remember from the COVID crisis is this is the moment when everything went digital. And if, this, is, this was the moment when every, everything became monitored, that we agreed to be surveyed all, all the time, not just in authoritarian machines, but even in democracies. And maybe most importantly at all, this was the moment when surveillance started going under the skin. I think that the big process that's happening right now in the world is uh, hacking human beings, the ability to hack humans to understand deeply what's happening within you, what, what, makes you what, what, what makes you go. And for that, the most important data is not what you read and who you meet and what you buy, it's what's happening inside your body. So we had these two big revolutions, the computer science revolution, or the, the infotech revolution, and the revolution in the biological sciences. And they are still separate, but they are about to merge. History is truly at a turning point. We do not yet know the full extent and the systemic and structural changes which will happen. However, we do know that global energy systems, food systems and supply chains will be deeply affected. But the fourth industrial revolution is actually changing ourselves. It's changing not only what we are doing, it's changing who we are. The fourth industrial revolution will lead to is a fusion of our physical, our digital, and our biological identities.